This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. What's up? Hey guys, we're doing chapter 12 <laughs> over in the pattern. <laughs> and we're doing it with Kelsey. She's back. Hey everyone, yeah. glad to be back. Is this the third time we've had Kelsey on a... Yeah. Third? Yeah. I think it's third. Yes, it's third. The second we did, time uh, was the... The random the, in-between yeah. episode. Yeah. In-between books episode? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just, like, talked. Uh, it's, it's like, too, kind of a half episode. It's, like, two solid hours of rambling. It's, <laughs> it's whatever. Good. Uh, like I said, it's the it's the after show for season one. <laughs> People the cannot after season listen show. to it or they can listen to it. Either yeah, totally fine. You won't miss a lot. iTunes changed the way they report statistics. So I now get a better idea of how much of a percentage of an episode people are listening to. Oh, Which is kind of, been, I just start, looked at that this morning for the first time. I'll have to show that to Patrick. I don't think he's seen it. I have the tangents. I yeah. forgot that's what it was called. That. <laughs> but like most of them are like in the high 90s. Some of them, I think, because people listen to it twice, get up to like 105% or something like that. Yeah. I have the tangents is definitely at like 76%. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm only halfway through. I've been listening to this crap for an hour. <laughs> I don't even think I listened to the whole thing because, I mean, I was there. So I'm like, I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to this. Yeah. I don't listen to all the episodes anymore. I used to. Yeah. I used to listen to all of them, but I mean, I certainly do when I'm editing. I may be burned out, but but I don't go back and listen to them. You know, I take that back. They are in my podcast feed. They pop up like everything else. I pretty yeah. much just listen to them in order. I've become less embarrassed listening to them. It's become easy. It used to be really hard for me to listen to my own voice, and I've become much more used to it uh, at this point. I, I can pr- sort of zone out and pretend I'm listening to somebody else. That's helpful. <laughs> and also having uh, John edit out the worst of it before I listen to it again helps quite a bit. <laughs> Just outsource it. Seriously, if you can get someone else to do your editing for you, I highly recommend it. I'll just start here. Today, we're talking about Chapter 12, Woven in the Pattern. And our symbol is the Flame of Tarvalin, appropriately Aguina and Nynaeve are kind of hanging out with the Emerlin and a bunch of Aes Sedai in this chapter. Wasn't that the chapter icon two chapters ago? Chapter 10 is the horn. Chapter 9. Chapter, chapter 9. Is nine. A flame. Yeah. Uh, leave takings. Yeah. So chapter 9, and then here we are, chapter 12. Is that also in a green? I think that was also in a green chapter. We just listened to Robert Jordan saying it. Yeah, I so there's this audio clip of Robert Jordan at... Do you uh, have signing. it? Can you play I it? Do. I do. I can play it, yeah. yeah. Can, he has a funny way of speaking. I haven't heard him talk much, Robert I, Jordan. I don't himself. think I've ever heard his voice. Oh, then I definitely want to play this for you guys. He's very dramatic. <laughs> and not a guini. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like someone was just holding their cell phone up in a crowd or something. Oh, I'm sure. And it was in 2009, so it wasn't exactly... It wasn't the, even a good cell yeah, phone. Yeah, it wasn't a good cell phone. <laughs> All right, here we go. The woman's name is Naive. It's a queen. Not a queen. And not a queen. A queen. A queen. Sardine. Sardar. Shonchan. Karyan. Abienda. Aiel. Asadai. Swan Sanche. Okay. Uh, I could and hear not some of it. Not Not Egwini. <laughs> yeah, you say swan very strange. It's swan, like a swan, not suan. Oh, yeah. I think I say suan. I, yeah, I say suan. Uh, not that that's right. I've just, you know, like most of these things, it's just the way I've been doing it. It's fine if you want to be wrong. I'm <laughs> just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> Egwene hurried after Nynaeve toward the knot of Aes Sedai around the Emerlin Seat's horse-born palanquin. Her desire to know what had caused the turmoil in Thaldara kept outweighing even her worry over Rand. He was beyond her reach, for the moment. Bella, her shaggy mare, was with the Aes Sedai's horses, and Nynaeve's mount, too. 
it goes on to talk about how the warders are surrounding the ice, the Amerlin seat. Swan, not Suwan. We just went over that. <laughs> you can say it however you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be right. And Swan is unconcerned about the little cut on her arm. She's a badass. Yeah, she is. I cut myself worse than that fishing. Fish guts. One of the things Egwene says is he was beyond her reach for the moment. And that's something that occurs pretty frequently in the series is over and over and over again. They're like, well, I can't help him now. I will later. And it's this promise of help that keeps getting put off over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. The cadence of the sentence, too, really shows that she's like. So it says he was beyond her reach, comma, for the moment, as if like, what, when do they even see each other again? Like almost like once or twice throughout the like the rest of the series. Well, I mean, they spend the time in the waste together. Oh, that's true. But yeah. they're not they don't spend a lot of time together when yeah. they're both she's off with the wise ones. They do like no helping each other pretty no. much. They like see each other in the distance every once in a while. Totally separate lives after this. I noticed, I forget where it was. Something to the effect of she like hints that a queen might be Taverin. Really? In this chapter? Swan would see her though. Yeah, I know. That's the that's kind of the kicker with right. speculating on other Taverin. Oh no, I was reading a quote. This is from the Eye of the World, I think. When Moraine says, You are part of the pattern too, both of you, in some fashion. Perhaps not Taverin, perhaps but strong even so. So we've talked about who Egwene could be reborn. And there's also a lot of old blood in Minethrin. So it's possible that either through having three Taviran in a town of like, what, a couple hundred people at most. I mean, they've spent their whole lives with him. Who knows how influential just living around them for 20 years has been. I sort of think of it like if you have one big Taviran thread pulling on the entire pattern, it's going to pull the most on the threads that are closest to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so sort of through extension, a lot of the people around him may not be themselves Taviran, but they get a lot of the Taviran effects because the reason they are in the right place at the right time is they have to be for Rand, for Matt, for Parent. Or they get spun off to do something that Rand needs done. Exactly. And so they sort of get they get some of that good luck because it's it's Rand's good luck or Matt's good luck. So that's why the band yeah. of the red hand is they literally are, you know, Matt's luck is rubbing off on them because if he wins a battle, they win a battle on like 10,000 people. Yeah. yeah. And it also could just be that this iteration, the dragon needs his core group of people. And so they're spun out right at the time that he needs them right in the village that he needs them. Exactly. Independent of their Taviranness. And he needs a queen to be the Amarillan seat. And so she's put on the fast yeah. track to becoming the Amarillan seat because Rand needs it and the pattern needs it. It helps that she's yep. ridiculously ambitious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Suan says something like that, that. Like, most other girls have no problem taking it slow enough to not be in danger. You, on the other hand, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, jumped in feet first. And there was a few other like you, like Moraine and, and one or two others. But There's a scene coming up in this chapter where Varen warns her, like, you don't, you don't have a natural fear of this. Oh, was that Varen? Should. Did I say? I said Suan. Oh, I think it's Varen. Yeah. yeah. It's Varen, yeah. But there's a great scene pr- on the next page which is Swan seeing the girls face to face for the first time. And she just looks them up and down and it's from Egwene's perspective. So she thinks that Swan is looking them up and down like tools to be used, which one, yes, absolutely. But two, it's really great reading that scene from a reread perspective because it's like past Amerlin sizing up future Amerlin and they have no idea how close their futures are intertwined oh yeah totally. i didn't even think of it that way and how eventually a queen ends up well i don't know who's i wouldn't say either is using the other but a queen benefits strongly from having suan around i mean basically suan becomes in her, her side in her rise to yeah early moments of her amerlin hood 
Totally. No, these these two become super close, and the relationship sw- switches. You know, I mean, a queen has to do that with almost all of her relationships. She's an apprentice to everyone at some point or the other yeah. in the series. And including the Sean Chan. Including the Sean Chan. Yeah. Which is, you know, who knows where she would be if she hadn't been a prisoner of the Sean Chan for a pretty, pretty good amount of time. But she has to turn around and assert her dominance over them one by one. You know, she has to assert her dominance over Suan multiple times. She has to beat the crap out of the Sean Chan. <laughs> she has to negotiate with the Aiel. She has to, you know, all these things that she was apprenticed to the people and then comes back as either an ally or their master. Within months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Her story is, is truly the rags to riches in a way that Rand's never really is because he's accepted as the leader from the beginning. Yeah. A queen has to struggle to... Yeah. Like, even when he's just traveling with Ingtar, Ingtar's like, oh, yeah, you're, you're next in command. He's like, I don't want that. He's like, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, too late. Not your decision. Yeah. And she, was, she wasn't she was supposed to be that way. They were like, ah, we're going to put, like, a really, you know, 18-year-old. We can manipulate get close to ran this is great totally she was a puppet mm. i'm not a puppet you're a puppet Psych. <laughs> <laughs> which is very satisfying to read you know she comes in as the 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 subordinate and only and has to earn their respect through submitting which if you think about it in a lot of ways their journey very closely resembles how they deal with the one power the yeah. queen conquers and rules by submitting herself to the various cultures and ran dominates them with force with yeah. force I do love the parallels there's so many different ways you could go about it you've got Gwen and Swan Gwen and Rand Rand and everyone <laughs> I just like that everything works on multiple levels it's like a good pun yeah it doesn't just work on one or two levels Kelsey pointed out the next thing that I had highlighted where Gwen takes a step back and curtsies to Swan I noted that Nynaeve doesn't curtsy. <laughs> and she tries really hard Pointedly. to not curtsy. Yeah. <laughs> she fumbled for Egwene's hand and gripped as hard as Egwene did. See, that's why I love Nynaeve. Because she puts up such a good front? Because she's so insecure, but she tries anyway. And I yeah, think that yeah. that's awesome. Well, it's the definition of bravery, isn't it? Yeah being terrified and trying anyway yeah i can see why it rubs people the wrong way at first she is kind of a jerk i was kind of looking i don't just random thought but i was looking at the tents flattened white domes just tall enough to stand up in i'm curious what they make those tents out of i don't know i was just domes. thinking of, like domes because they're not straight sticks so they've got to have like bent i'm asking the camper here though if he knows oh you're i'm reading the description you can see modern tents are definitely dome shaped. Oh, yeah, yeah, yurts. With the two bent, like the bent X. Yeah. Structure. It have to be something fast to set up. And light to carry. But I mean, yeah, but the warders are doing that. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Obviously, <laughs> or using the power. I don't know. Uh, probably caravans. I mean, if you're not afraid of eyes to die, working for the White Tower is not a bad gig. I mean. It seems like they have a ton of money. Yeah. It's probably hazard pay, too. You might get attacked. White Tower doesn't go out of business. It's like working for the government, you know? Yeah. Been in business for thousands of years. Yeah, longer than the government. Probably get a pension and stuff. Definitely a good deal. Well, you know you get a pension working for more gays. They have, like, a whole set of apartments for the pensioners. Yeah, yeah that's true. The fringe benefits are pretty nice. You break your leg, they heal you right up. No problem. Great, great health benefits. <laughs> Retirement, health benefits. Can I work for the Aes Sedai? <laughs> I want to. Right? Where can I get that, that deal? Sounds great. But yeah, so Lan and Nynaeve sort of have a little, uh, well, Lan comes to talk to Nynaeve. Yeah, I was wondering what happened in the conversation there. And- I assume it's mostly just a repeat of their previous conversation. I can't imagine what... He would say, though, because he's like, let's talk. Lan came once to the tent Aguin shared with Nynaeve. 
taking the wisdom into the night a little distance away. Egwene peered around the tent flap to watch. She could not hear what they said, except that Nynaeve eventually erupted in anger and came stalking back. Egwene notes that her cheeks seemed wet. After that, he did not come again. So we have no idea what that's about. But I think uh, probably more of the same. I, I assume it's saying. him saying, "I basically, I can't be with you again. And her being like, why, why did you come and tell me that? <laughs> I could see that. I'm also, I've also speculated. Well, and, and also it says he stood watching the tin in the darkness for a long time. Um, so he's clearly, you know, brooding. Do you think he was like waiting for her to come out? I think he was just like thinking, like processing his feelings. Mm-hmm. Or maybe waiting to see if she would come out again. I'm also wondering if another possibility could be that he like came over and was like, hey, how's it going? And she's like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> he's like How, how's your how's your trip in really no but then you know it says she she's crying so maybe he she was like really and then it escalated where she's like you're just gonna come talk to me like there's nothing wrong yeah i just can't imagine after that last conversation of like yeah we can't be together here's my ring i never want to see you again unless you need me Valron right kind of pointed out in the discord feed that maybe he just can't stay away it's more or less what she said and is trying to prove to himself that this the course of action that he's picking is the best one right so that's what i'm thinking maybe he does like the awkward hey how's it going if i were lan i'd probably do end up doing something similar yeah yeah, i'd be really awkward and weird but but i'm not but (laughs) lan's that's what i'm thinking like that just seems natural it sounds like something i would do or something that could happen to me like in a relationship it's awkward yeah, there's nothing rational about love. You can say that again. Because <laughs> he's telling himself, like, we definitely can't be together. I'm going to die in the blight, which, ah, so stupid. Like, Lan, no, that's not helpful. And everyone thinks it's ridiculous, and Nynaeve thinks it's ridiculous, but he's convinced. It also seems like something that, that Jordan just wrote in. To kind of show, like, the tension. Show that this is a continuing thing. Sure. Yeah, but that's kind of boring, so I like I like discussing it. It is the, it's just their relationship is very, I mean, it's it's very, very contentious and very, um, neither one of them is willing to admit to it first, in a way. They both sort of want the other person to give. Yeah, and you know, at this point, that's not really... Maybe this is part of what's creating Nynaeve's feelings. Like, Moraine is really in the way. Like, how could Lan ever really have a relationship with another, you know, an ongoing relationship with another woman if you're bonded to one? Even though Moraine and Lan's right. relationship isn't romantic or sexual, you're, she's, he's still bonded. He's chained to her. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't get to make his own choices. Not really. No. And I think that's the real crux of it. And that's why she hates Moraine so much. And... Right after Moraine disappears is kind of when things start happening with between her right. and Lan. Well, Lan spends three books traveling overland to Muriel or whatever. That's why. So he disappears for a while. Is that three books? God. It, it feels like a very it's long so time. Long. It's yeah. three books. Well, so that's the end of book five. He leaves. So he's not in book six at all. And then halfway through book seven. So a book and a half. Is it- Although... Muriel, they get married, like an, it's Morel. Myra, Myrel, Morel. I say Morel. It could be Myrel. I think Muriel is how they say it in the Morella. audio books. Morella. Mor- oh, jeez. <laughs> <It could be. laughs> We're all over really the place like on that one. <laughs> yeah. Is there? There should be a pronunciation key. Oh, there is a pronunciation key in the wiki. <laughs> Three lines down. Myrel Berengari. Berengari. Yeah. And I said I have the green aja. I just wanted to do a little bit of follow up. In the last episode, we were trying to figure out why they were in such a hurry to get, and there was news about Tome and Head, and we were like, "Why? It does. Why are they trying to get back so quickly?" And and she talks about it here that they're they're going to use the winds to push them along, and and we had a an email from James McGrath, I think is his name, and he was saying 
the significance of the hurry comes from the prophecy that was written on the wall. The news wasn't important until they read the dark prophecy that talked about Toman Head. And then all of a sudden there's new context mm-hmm. to that news. And that's why it's important that they have to rush back. Oh, I didn't even make that connection. So but, I, thought that, I thought that was a really good observation. Right. The I said I only know that something is happening until they see the dark prophecy. And then they attach way more significance to it. And so then they start, they're like, oh man, that thing that we knew about, that means something. We better... Do they see the part about Tome and Head? Yeah. Rand scrubs off part of it before anyone sees it. Well, He but that... scrubs off his name, right? Well, he's, there's two parts, right? There's the, we'll meet again on Tome and Head, Althor. Yeah. That Fane writes on the door. And then there's the Trolloc script poem, which is translated. And that does mention not necessarily Tome and Head, but Almuth Plain. And the uh, the area right next to Toman Head. That's right. And so Varen has that translation for the Armelin seat, and that definitely mentions that area, if not necessarily Toman Head itself. But because it mentions the Watchers over the waves, and they know that's in Toman Head. Like they know that the prophecy re- references that city, and quite a few things. Daughter of the night, she walks again. The shining wall, she'll kneel. The Watcher's weight on Toman's head. So it does mention Toman's head? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they don't know what the Watchers mean. Uh, I thought Varen had a pretty decent guess that it was the the Watchers who watch the waves. And wait for the return. And wait for the return. this small yeah. group. The crazy people that think that Archer Hawkwing's armies are coming back. <laughs> and they're right. Yeah, they were They were right. But then, then they Chom-chan. ended up in a cage. Chom Chom. That was such a good... <laughs> It's so dramatic. I noted a little after where we were that Nynaeve says something really similar to what Egwene thinks. It was basically, Rain will be all right. He has Lord Ingtar and 20 lances with him, and there's nothing either of us can do about it. Not yet. Nynaeve yeah. says like almost the same thing. It they're is almost exactly the same thing. Really concerned about mm-hmm. him, and they're really thinking of their time in the White Tower as like, it's going to be this short time where they... I feel like they're viewing it as a short time where they're going to learn how to channel and then they can go and help Rand with his terrible fate. And in a lot of ways, Nynaeve does that. Right. I think I would say she really she, follows through. She follows that to the letter. I, I mean, just, I mean, pretty much as best she can. I mean, uh, when she meets up with Rand, he finds her, but she didn't know where he was. Right. When he, when he shows up all ugly. Yeah, I love that scene so much. That's really good. Wait, well, what is what scene is that? Oh, he goes to like visit Nynaeve and to pick her up so they can cleanse the the one power. Yeah, and they're in uh, Camelin. They're in Camelin, and he sh- uses the mask of mirrors to like look like the ugliest possible dude he can look like. Oh, I forgot all about this. And then Elaine shows up, and they're they're basically you know they're all they're making out, and the serving women think she's like in there making out with this super ugly dude and they're all like giving her sketchy looks and like (laughs) they actually weren't making out they were literally conceiving twins is that when they had is that when they yeah Yeah. you're right that is that's true well they were they were kissing at first and then the maid came in and like she was all flustered and it was all yeah (laughs) i like the way you put that they were busy conceiving (laughs) they were busy conceiving (laughs) twins I can, I'm allowed to say sex on a podcast. It's okay. <laughs> he, yeah, he goes to Nynaeve's rooms and she's like, who the hell are you? And he's like, and she's like, you're no two rivers man. Cause he says, oh, you know, I'm here about women's circle business. And right. Nynaeve immediately is like, what, what? <laughs> women's circle business. And, uh, which I thought was a really clever way to get her attention. I'm a sucker for reunion scenes in any book. But yeah, it's a great scene. We can discuss that later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which book is that? Uh, oh, it's in book uh, eight, it's book right? Nine. nine. Yeah. No, oh, geez. There's yeah, so many great yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that eventually. <laughs> that happened in that scene. But I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> we, we got a few more hours to go. Uh, yeah. A few more years to go. I See, will. Baron shows up for training. Yeah. We'll start us off there. Uh, they're talking about Mar- Moraine, and Nynaeve says, "I'll believe Moraine." is done with us when she's dead, or we are. She's sly, that one. Other eyes said I came to their tent. Aguine almost jumped out of her skin the first night out of, out of Faldara. 
when the tent flap was pushed aside and a plump, square-faced Aes Sedai with graying hair and a vaguely distracted look in her eyes ducked into the tent. Egwene thought she felt something, and she almost saw something about the Aes Sedai when the flame grew brighter. So we're, she's starting to see the glow around other women when they can channel. I liked that that was in there. Oh, I didn't even notice that. I am Varen Mathwin, the woman said with a smile, and you are Egwene Elvir and Nynaeve Elmira from the two rivers. Egwene asks if it's a summons to the Emerlin, and Ver- Varen laughs. <laughs> yeah, like, no, no, no. <laughs> You're not important. <laughs> You're not that important. <laughs> but she does say... You both have considerable potential, especially you, Nynaeve. One day, she paused, rubbing a finger thoughtfully right atop the ink smudge. That's on her nose. But this is not one day. I'm here to give you a lesson, Aguin. You have been poking in ahead of yourself, I fear. Aguin says, what have I done? Nothing I'm aware of. Oh, nothing wrong. Not exactly. Just dangerous, she says. And that's where we get to this point where Varen basically says, you're jumping in. Most girls with the seed inside of them like you are afraid of it too. Even after they reach the tower, even after they've learned what to do and how, for months they need to be led step by step by a sister or one of the accepted. But not you. From what Moraine tells me, you leaped into it as soon as you knew you could, fumbling your way through the dark with never a thought of whether there was a bottomless pit under your next step. And I just love that assessment of Egwene's character. Like she, she just goes forward and goes for it without a thought for the danger under her feet. Aguin and her crazy ambition. Yeah, she really is like that. And it's a good description of her whole personality. Totally. Any power that she can gain, she like lunges headlong before, well, she hasn't always had everything thought through. Mm -hmm. She's And in contrast to that, she manipulates Nynaeve and it's pretty hilarious. Both of them are crazy powerful, and there's no way any sister is going to let them not go to the tower. Right. But how they get them both there is very different based on their personalities. So Nynaeve, they all use reverse psychology, and Varen is like, you know, novices do chores. Yeah. (laughs) And you, you might not be a novice if, you know. I teach you some things. And she's like, well, maybe I'll stay. Maybe I'll stay and watch. Maybe. <laughs> and meanwhile, she's challenging Aguin and saying, right. can, can and you handle she's it? she's saying like, can you, you know, it's really difficult. You've jumped into it far ahead of yourself. You know, can you, yeah, can you handle it? And it's like perfect, perfect assessments of their personalities and getting them to the tower. Hook them, hook, line, and sinker. Is that a phrase? Yep. Yes. Hook them, hook, line, and sinker. Sure. Capture them. I'm not really. Sure. You got <laughs> them, hook, line, and sinker. That's that's what I was saying. No, I, but they they say I said I put their hooks in you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and just by doing that, just by reading your personality and appealing to what you want. I mean, and that's how Aguin ends up pulling in the can and pulling in the sea folk and pulling in the Aeels by by figuring out what they want and offering it to them. And that's how she's able to link them back to the tower. I did want to talk about this quote about Wilders. So this is a little bit of an info dump from Varen. But when I read this, I was like, oh, that's where I got that association between Wilders and developing a block. Where Varen's saying, because Egwene had already channeled. Varen said patiently. So, so have I. Nynaeve did not sound happy about it. Your circumstances are different, child. That you are still alive shows that you weathered the various crises and did it on your own. I think you know how lucky you are. Of every four women forced to do what you did, only one survives. Of course, Wilders, Varen grimaced, forgive me, but I'm afraid that is what we in the White Tower often call women who, without any training, have managed some rough control, random, and barely enough to be called control, usually, like you, but still control of a sort. Wilders have difficulties, it is true. Almost always they have built up walls to keep themselves from knowing what it is they were doing, and those walls interfere with conscious control. The longer the walls have to build, the harder it is to tear them down. But if they can be demolished, well, some of the most adept sisters have been Wilders. 
Nynaeve shifted irritably and looked at the entrance, entrance as if thinking of leaving. <laughs> yeah, I just it's a it's a great paragraph to describe what a wilder is. And I did notice that it you could have walls that weren't very high. So I was kind of mm. thinking about like I think we had this debate about whether Rand was a wilder or not and whether he had any blocks. Mhm. Hmm. And I th and I think this is a great information for him that maybe he is slowly developing a block, but he it's gets his easy training to early enough, yeah. I think. And he is conscious of what he's doing. Like he's is it the next time we see Rand Channel is the very first time he's completely conscious of what he's doing. Right. He enters the void, sees the light, and reaches out through the taint and all. Because he knows he's channeling, he's not going to develop a block. Right. Because the block is really to keep them from knowing that they're channeling. The same with Aguin, where although she's, um, well, I guess she's guided from the first by yeah. Moraine. Yeah. Where, yeah. Whereas Nynaeve ha hasn't known what she, that she was doing anything at all. So this comes back to Nynaeve shot first. Because uh, I think one of the key points in that debate was that she would not have been able to use lightning because she has a block in place and she wasn't angry enough. Well, but she's been channeling for years. And complex channeling, too. Right. So she must have a massive, healing, massive block. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Or when she's angry. And she's angry. We yeah. know she's angry when she heals. Right. I mean, in this next scene, she almost sets the tent on fire because she's frustrated. She's so right. So I guess that's in the white camp scene. In the white camp. White cloak camp. White cloak camp white scene. White cloak camp. Mm -hmm. White cloak camp scene. That's what I was trying to say. That's a tough one. She's not angry. And she has a massive block. Yeah, not angry, but desperate. Right. So I guess that's my that's where my, my debate comes down to is I really do think she did it first, but it's one of those things where uh it's tough tough to reconcile that with the fact that she has this massive block and shouldn't be able to even come close to channeling unless she's super angry. I'm thinking it also comes <laughs> down to the mechanism of blocks. And how how they work. Mm -hmm. It's psychological. Definitely. And that's why I think it might be possible that extreme need could get around it. Yeah. And Varen, Varen says specifically built up walls to keep themselves from knowing what it was they were doing. But once mm -hmm. those walls are built, you can't just tear them down. An inherent problem with that theory that I haven't been able to quite solve yet, even I'm though I want it to be true. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Because I want it to be true. Good enough I mean, for me. <laughs> you know what? That's fine with a theory like that. Do you do you disagree? Or I mean, on on that one, I do. Yeah, but I yeah. have my own like head canon that I'm like, eh, you know, maybe <laughs> there's evidence for it, but I just believe it. Like that's the great thing about fictional universes. Yeah, exactly. And you know, post book like post book ending theories. So Varen continues on her spiel. The next couple of paragraphs, I just want to talk about them all. Go for it. Just the quote uh, that Varen has about Moraine, where she says, did Moraine never explain any of this to you? <laughs> <laughs> and then she goes, well, Moraine has never believed in telling anyone anything they did not need to know. Knowing serves no real purpose, but then neither does not knowing. Myself, I always prefer knowing to not. And it's just like, yeah, that's probably Moraine's biggest character flaw. Yeah. I, I related and, to Varen's perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And Varen's biggest uh, feature. Yeah. Virtue. That's she wants to know everything. Exactly. She always prefers knowing to not, including knowing about the dark. Yeah. I did notice, I don't know if this is the right time to bring this up, but I did notice that the first couple of sisters that are sent to train the girls are all black sisters. Varen's first. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then is it Alvierin? Alvierin. Is next. Alvierin. And then Leandrin. And then Leandrin. Uh -huh. <laughs> the first three. <laughs> Eve kicks Leandrin out of the tent and yeah, he's right. like, I don't know why she did that. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, just 
Get out of here, bitch. Basically. <laughs> I mean, she is. Leandrin's a jerk to everyone. Oh, totally. She wasn't yeah, even trying to. Ugh, she wasn't even trying to teach. She was just grilling them about Rand. And I, I mean, I suspect Leandrin expects two soft, weak novices, and instead she runs into Nynaeve. Who's yeah. not soft or weak, although she is a novice. Mm, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call Nynaeve a novice yet. Eh, they like want her so bad that they're gonna convince her to jump to the accepted. Yeah, I mean, I guess she's not technically a novice, but I, I think um, you know what I mean. She's I she's do, expecting yeah. like two girl right. two girl children, and instead right. she gets like Nynaeve. sixteen year olds. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. Egwene, who's a mule <laughs> but even Egwene is just she's totally willing to go along with it as long as she's being taught yeah true Nynaeve no Nynaeve she no. refuses to be insulted in any way or degraded. teach her the way she wants to be taught or get the hell out <laughs> literally uh, snakes and foxes wrote and um Varen mentions that until you're in the cap- most capable hands of Shirium that comes up soon another black also a black sister yeah, I, I just have black Aja all, all over this chapter. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. everywhere. Um, I don't know how much you wanted to go through Varen's lesson here. I'll let I'll let you lead. Yeah, here, a, I, a lot of it actually. <laughs> I kept I kept like highlighting a sentence and then highlighting the next sentence and then highlighting the next <laughs> sentence. One thing: the more you try and touch the true source, the more you try and channel the one power, the easier it becomes to actually do it. Mm-hmm. Again, most of this I think is actually relevant to Rand. I think that's one of the tricks that Robert Jordan likes to pull is telling us about Rand's situation through the eyes to eyes description to Egwene. He did it a little bit with Moraine in the first chapter when Rand was like in the bushes listening. And I think a little bit of that is going on here as well. I did kind of have that mm-hmm. thought in passing as I was going through this where there, you know, there are a lot of similarities, although Moraine says like no sister could teach you how to channel Rand. I, they can't literally, but in a, I, I feel like in a more figurative way, at least someone could have tried to walk him through. Like there are a lot someone of similarities. Tried. Yeah, yeah. At least explain what happens to women, so that when he saw, you know, his body changing too. He, you know, right. I understand it exactly women's the same, and men's but... bodies change. Women's and men's bodies change in different ways, but like, they both change. So I'm, I'm I'm equating puberty with learning the channel. It's kind but, of, but basically <laughs> they Marine happen around Rand. the same time. Yeah, your body is going through changes, man. <laughs> you, you may sprout what the one power in odd places. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder though if they just like are so squicked out by a man channeling that even if they were like maybe we could try, they're like no 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 no. That's that's very true. It's really, really gross to them. That's a good point. Think think if every man over the past who could have sex over the past 3,000 years had a virulent disease that could infect you. Yeah. You'd find sex with that kind of man really gross. It's just like that because it's dangerous, the revulsion is built in. Not that there's anything wrong. If you have a venereal disease. <laughs> venereal disease. Use a condom, folks. <laughs> Practice this safe sex channeling. Education brought to we you have by modern medicine. Spoilers. It's okay. You won't die. Yeah. Have you all seen Mean Girls? If you have sex, you will get pregnant and you will die. <laughs> Stop trying to make fetch happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But yes, yeah, so I said I are incredibly freaked out by men channeling and i really well okay really everyone is. Def- everyone is and in their defense like for the past three thousand years if you channeled you would go crazy and you would kill your whole village or something right and if you don't die immediately you rot while you're alive it's terrifying the one- i mean how it would be terrifying like you have magical powers and you are insane. The one thing I would say to that is even the Forsaken who were around long before the taint say there's no way for men and women to teach each other. That's true. And they were around during the Age of Legends. The power. I think there's a difference between 
how to use the power and what the effects of using the power on a person are. Yeah, so when Nguyen tells Rand and they sort of sit down and try and talk about like how do you channel? She's trying to, she's like trying to work out how to channel. And he's like, yeah, I just poke a hole through the pattern. And she's like, uh, she's like crazy. that would be bad. You know, like you can't teach each yeah. other methods like that. Oh no. Yeah. I, what I was talking about was really just as far as in going into this meditative state and finding the source and then getting it. Although like there are even differences there. You could at least get to that point where I feel like if you were to say, this is how you channel side R Rand would be able to take at least some of that. Maybe. Mm-hmm. But I also think that looking at it, we know what he can take and what he can't. And he has no idea. Right. And, and you know, if you were to try, yeah. try to embrace Sidene, you would die. Right. Or right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess men call, I call it seizing how... Sidene. Jordan describes it right like Sidar you have to surrender and embrace it and like go through the flow of a river whereas right Chris, it's different for the if you try Sidine. try to force your will upon Sidar you'll die and if you try to um, embrace or like accept Sidine you'll die yeah. you'll die that's an so, important point and that's probably a very quick way for them to be like they see a woman trying to help a man and the man tries to do it and he dies and vice versa. And they're like, yeah, let's not do that That's anymore. So, yeah. And they wouldn't know to seize it because they have like no idea. Yeah. It, I, I see a little bit of interesting um, circumstances around that when male and females are bonded and one of like a female controls the male f- flows that's always an interesting little parallel to me where they're like, they're channeling the male one pow- side of the power, but because they're using the male channeler sort of like an angriol, maybe it's. That's it's, the way I see it. That one person embraces and then, ta- or, you know, embraces or seizes and taps into the, um, into the power. And then if a woman is say, then channeling Sidene through a man, they do talk about how it feels different, like the threads of the power feel different, but they're not like a woman doesn't seize Sidene. Right. She just has it at her disposal like a pool to. But it's actually the man who is doing the channeling in a lot of ways, the same way that the um, the Sean Chan. Like he's the spigot it. and she's taking a bucket of water from it. I would I would almost say that he is the one throwing it on the fire, but she's pointing out where to throw it. Yeah. Like she never thro- she never has the bucket of Sidin in her possession, but she's like through the bond is able to make him weave it the way she wants him to. Like almost more like com- like a com- compulsion. With the Sean Chan, right? They they say the Marath Damani are the ones channeling, whereas the ones holding the leash don't actually channel. Right. But they're the ones who are. Con- Control, directing directing what needs to get done and so in, in the same way i think of if you're bonded with somebody and using their power now i'm not talking about anything like what happens when one of those poor men begins channeling you will not go mad you won't die not with sisters to teach you and guide you but what might you do entirely by accident never meaning to for an instant the vagueness had dropped from Varen's eyes for an instant, it seemed, the Aes Sedai's gaze had flickered from Leguine to Nynaeve as sharply as Amarlin's had. And so I think, you know, that that flicker, that eye flicker to the side is basically saying, you know, she's talking about a man channeling. And she's sort of giving him a little sidelong glance to say, yeah, I know about Rand. That's my interpretation of it. Egwene thought, can she know about Rand? It is impossible. She'd never have let him leave Faldara if she even suspected. Yeah, and, of, and of course she, she knows. Does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As we saw her tell Moraine and Suan in the previous chapter. Everyone knows. Every, well, yeah. I guess Le- I'll, Well, those three. Those three know. Leandrin probably knows because she's... was a, We think she was a dark friend social. She definitely could have been one as well yeah. as Alviarin. Right. Let's think we've got three three Stark sisters here, and two of them definitely could have been at the any two of them could have been at the Dark Friend Social. And mm-hmm. from what's his name's description, 
Does he only see two there? He two does, sisters? and I guess the, I that guess there mean could the third be isn't there. Right, another one. We don't. We're not sure there was only two, but there were two that were together. At least two. Yeah. Ugh. It, it could have been any number of you know. What about Shirium? Could have been any number of sisters there. It could have been or not there. I mean, like a third of I said I are dark friends, so and we have no real way of narrowing it down other than uh, plot wise, story wise, it makes sense that some of the dark sisters that we're meeting now were the ones at that meeting, but we don't have any direct evidence for that other than plot wise, it's convenient and would make sense that they got their instructions, which then led to a lot of what's going on now. Yeah. Because we know that Ingtar was there. Ingtar was an obvious one. Who's like the not the one not trying to hide, or not hiding well? No, the Shinaran who acts and talks just like Inktar. Yeah, that is what I will try to help you with tonight, and what a sister will help you with every night until we put you in Shiriam's most capable hands. She is mistress of novices, black sister. She, she has to be responsible for the recruitment of so many into the Black Aja. I mean, they have. Mistress of novices. They have like a third of the reds. Oh, it's a huge, huge number. They just funnel people right mm-hmm. into the black Aja. No, the system is set up for her to screen people who are who would be amenable to being approached. Yeah. That's why sometimes I get frustrated when people post online like that I said I was so terrible. I hate them. And it's like, well, yeah, like they're infiltrated the, with dark friends. Like they're, they're really a corrupted infected. body. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not only are like government institutions incredibly flawed, but like a third of them are working for the dark side. Is it, don't we see numbers eventually? Isn't yeah. it close to a third? Yeah. I can't yeah. remember. It's like somewhere between a quarter and a third or something like that. Uh, uh, after I can't remember. we get Varen's notebook. Yeah. We pretty much detail all of them. Yeah, they've, they've. It's like a third was, of most Aes Sedai, fewer in the blue, more in the red. Aradia wrote, Ish played the long game when he founded the Black Aja. Yeah, he did. Black Aja's yeah. playing the long game. And this is where Varen manipulates both girls into staying for lessons. Yeah. You should stay, Varen said. You could profit by it. From what Moraine has told me. It should take only a little training for you to be raised to accept it. Did I mention novices do chores? <laughs> <laughs> chores? The accepted, on the other hand, are expected to question things, as it is felt they know enough to know what questions to ask and when to ask. Which do you think you would prefer? Nynaeve's hands tightened on her skirt. I suppose I might as well, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Baron said. Now. <laughs> As if she wasn't expecting that. And part of it is Nynaeve would make a horrible novice. She would drive them all insane. Oh, yeah. yeah. She'd probably end up getting kicked out. Yeah, there's no way. Like, she would get frustrated. (laughs) It'd be horrible. She would leave. (laughs) She would just be like, fuck this. (laughs) Well, I think the other problem is you're also trying to contain a two-ton bull, right? Nynaeve is already as powerful as anyone in the tower, as a full sister. And she's only going to grow I, more powerful. Yeah. Right. And, and she like, just has no control over what that she they've does. they've ever had. Yeah. So you sort of have to give her some autonomy. And also, I think that's part of the problem with the White Tower training system that Egwene tries to fix in her tenure as Amarlin, that they pick uh, novices at the age range that they do because they're... Malleable. They'll listen. They're malleable. They're young. Like It's basically like boarding school. But you get a 30-year-old woman... No, she's not going to scrub your pots like for, you know, lesson training. I mean, well, coming back to the Black Aja, I wonder if the reason that they want malleable young women as novices is not because they're better trainer able to train, but because they're easier to recruit to the to the black. And that's yeah, that could definitely be part of it, too. They could be, you know, in it before they even realize what's happening. I think a lot of those rules are entirely, you know, pushed forward by the Black Hot Jaw. Don't go out and heal. Don't fight along the blight. Mm-hmm. Isolate yourself. Yeah, I think Only get young women. If I were running the Green Hot I'd be like, well, I'm going to put like two sisters in each 
borderland nation to just like rotate them out yeah you're doing five years like if you, as soon as you get in here's how you start every century you do another decade something like that yeah i can't imagine why anyone would be in the tower like granted at this point when we are in the series there's a whole lot of fear and animosity towards Aes Sedai but if I mean they should have been all over the continent helping people healing yeah. and I mean, helping with crops a good way to prevent farming. that animosity would be by like running hospitals and schools and then you could also yeah. you could also recruit you know little girl gets pneumonia and you know that's how you when you're healing her you find out oh she has the spark I'm nodding as it as it happens, we have a place open in our special school. It's totally free, and we'll take care of your family for the like rest Professor of your life. Xavier. <laughs> <laughs> Full scholarship yeah. for this yeah. one. She but, shows potential. Right. It's crazy what they're doing. You know that when they talk about, they're worried about their. They're all they talk about is their numbers dwindling, and that's the most important thing to them right now. Yeah, but nobody goes and looks. <laughs> And also, nobody marries and has kids. Like, if there's any genetic component to this, which there probably is. there is, like, you're basically just culling the entire channeling population. The men die. Yeah. I and, mean, and the, the women, women are never really into the eyes to die and become celibate for the most part. Yeah. Stay in the tower. Yeah. Or at mm-hmm. least never have children. Right. Even even the greens don't have children. When, yeah. Even when they... No do marry their warders and have group sex. <laughs> Who is saying that that's implied? I think you were. <laughs> me? No, I didn't. <laughs> no, one of you said it. And it wasn't me. I don't think it was me. Uh-huh. <laughs> they totally have birth control weaves, and they definitely keep that from the novices. Oh, yeah. Oh, snakes and foxes f- is fessing up to the group sex thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Obviously, you don't really have to worry about venereal disease when you can heal it with one power. Yeah. So They totally have contraception weaves, and they definitely have weaves to take care of menstruation. And I'm convinced that they would not tell the novices about that either because mm-hmm. they're jerks. Well, and like Dineve knows about uh, heart leaf tea, which is uh, a contraceptive. Yeah. So they have teas mm-hmm. as well. Um, herbal contraceptives. I think Min says that, but Nynaeve definitely would know about it. Oh yeah, that's, that's true. I guess Min's taking it. She's thinking about taking it with Rand because she doesn't want to have kids, or she is taking it with him, isn't she? Yeah. It's it's assumed that she is because she has when Elaine and Rand are hooking up, and then Min and Avi and Brigitte are all <laughs> like sharing. That through the bond, she has a vision of Elaine and her twins, and she's like, "Oh, she should have drank in the heart leaf tea." Right. Wow, I just said the word drinking. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's really embarrassing when I say that word. Drinking. Anyway. But does uh, but Min's not taking it. It's presumed that she is because I mean she doesn't get pregnant. Why else would she mention right. it? Oh yeah, I see here after Min Avienda. Min and Avienda leave Elaine and Rand alone. Min says Elaine should have drank the heartleaf tea. Avienda replies, Elaine wants to have kids. Yeah. I just, whenever it comes to herbs, I assume it's Nynaeve's the source of the information about them. Normally she is, but they're like, you know, she provided the two rivers with all kinds of contraceptive herbs. No, because that's women's circles business and I do not stick my nose in that. <laughs> exactly. Don't want to be like Sin Bowie getting his <laughs> nose up in women's circle business. So they're they're trying to channel and they're doing the the rose petal, sitting there for hours and hours and hours, opening the rose petal over and over again. And Nynaeve's getting more and more frustrated and the Queen's having minor success. Minor success is a good way to describe it. I like that the Varen describes the blackthorn bush here. And I think from then on, uh, Nynaeve always pictures the blackthorn bush when she's doing the exercise i was thinking that as i read this doesn't is she pictured again as doing that 
using the black song? Yes. Yes, constantly. I can't wait for you guys to get to this chapter, but in the testing, she, in her last arch, it's when she's in Malkir and she has to, like, reject this perfect life with Lan. And she creates the ga- the doorway that only comes once disappears. And so she creates it in her mind, like wills the gate to reappear. And as she throws herself through the gate, she throws herself through a bush of, of black thorns. And she, when she comes out of the circle, she has two thorns piercing each of her palms. And, Stigmata. Uh, yeah. Is and that- then, um, symbolic of something well so i think it's one of the first clues we have that the the, these testing arches are related to teleron riyadh because she comes out and she and nynaeve's crazy powerful even though she doesn't have formal teleron riyadh training at this point but she comes out and Shiram's like, what? This isn't supposed to happen. You're not supposed to, you know, be so, affected by so it's it not that she's, the arch. It's not that she's any good at channeling. It's that she's good at imposing her will upon things, which makes her able to open the gateway. She's stubborn. Correct. Yeah. She wills it back open. You know, I think she might also be using the power. Yes, she is. So, but, but she can't, she's not supposed to be able to remember that she can channel. The only reason she can even right. remember that she can channel is because she's so stubborn and her mind is so set that like the thing that was supposed to make you forget didn't work on her. So hmm. she imagines this blackthorn bush, which hmm. she uses as her mental trick to channel and it appears in the archway, I guess, as she steps through. Yep. Because she's. And. You know, the the other clue that we know those are related to the Dream Terror on Grial is, of course, with when we get the resonance, resonance when Varen gives Egwene the Twisted Circle Terror on Grial, and she brings it in with her to her testing. And you get that ringing that goes back and forth and nearly kills her. Yeah. So, And they say the only time that's ever happened is when we have two Terror on Grial related to a very similar thing in the same room. And since we know the ring Terror on Grial is related to Teleron Riyadh, we must know that the accepted test is related to Teleron Riyadh. Makes sense. So we get a couple of clues, but it's pretty obvious that the three rings, what you're doing is somehow entering a version of Teleron Riyadh. Like Dream Shard? Yeah. That's created by Terangriel? That would make a lot of sense if they were Dream Shards. Yeah. And it would make sense how that then... And they have to be created from your mind also, or from the mind of the person that's... Yeah, or or perhaps it uses your mind to put you in the right one. Right. Because the the people running the test wouldn't have known enough about the lives of the women to to tempt them up their fears, their, you know, how to play their heartstrings. But they're dumping a ton of power into that Tehran Real. Right. So and it takes thirteen women, right? Is it thirteen that they I thought use? It was six. Six? I can't remember. Do you but remember, a, Kelsey? A good number. I think it's one per arch. So three. Three. I thought it was more than that. I know they start out with a bigger number, and then like she comes out, and there are fewer just maintaining it, and then there's a bunch gathered around at the end. Because like they called in reinforcements, but I thought that like oh, right, right. There, was, there was more to start. Yeah. Okay, so the chosen are saying it's three for the accepted test and more for the full sister. Yeah, I think it's one is underneath each arch. Do you go through the same archway for the full test for a full sister? Uh it, it's a. I think it's a different. It's different on Grial, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because you have sisters inputting into an on girl and they create the scenarios. Right, right. Or influence the scenarios. They're just trying to terrify them. And then they're trying to create the right. hundred weaves. Yes. Where each arch touched a ring, touched where arch touched ring and I said I sat cross legged on the bare stone of the floor, staring at the silvery construction. Arches and rings were all of one piece, and then there's three. Okay. 
obviously. But moving back to chapter 12. Yeah, let's reel this yeah. in. <laughs> I, I made a little note. It says, Alana showed too much interest in Rand and Matt and Perrin, especially Rand. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, yeah, she she does. Alana's a bit of a predator, for lack of a better word. I'm avoiding yeah, saying I'm... cougar. I don't know why. She's totally... <laughs> I'd say she's a predator. Yeah. What su- what sucks is I I liked her and I want to like her. She just man, she really blew it. I never really got into her head. I never really understood her motivation. You know, she seemed to think that she could just tame Rand simply by bonding him. And then it was just I always think she disappointed. Is desperate for relevance. Yeah. I don't think it's it's Rand so much as it's Rand or Matt or Perrin. She wants to be on the front lines, and I think that that can be, which is why she's a green, right? I think it, it can have a really noble aspect, like you always want to be there um, in the action, helping people. She obviously has some of the unhealthy aspect, which is just like... A, you know, just lusting for power and relevance. Berlin has sort of the same attitude. She checks out Matt and she says, nope, too much like me. She checks out, <laughs> uh, she tries to go for Rand and she gets rebuffed. And only then does she settle on Perrin. Well, she got scared. She got the shit scared out of her because there was that uh, bubble of evil that was That's right. specific for each of the boys. And she was right there. And so I think it really freaked her out. She was with Rand at that one, right? Mm-hmm. Is that the one with the mirror? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh man, there's a really good piece of fan art floating around out there of that. He's like sitting on the bed afterwards, holding the sword, all cut up. I'll have to without a shirt on. Google that. Yeah, without a shirt. Stony plains and angles. Just before that, we see we see Nynaeve get pissed off and burn some blankets. She finally gets angry. You know, she basically gets so frustrated with the teaching that she gets really angry and thinks of a small flame. Nynaeve gave a croaking laugh. I am not frightened. She glanced sideways at the smoking blankets and twitched her eyes away. It takes more than a little fire to frighten me. But she did not look at the blankets again, even when the warder came to take them away and leave new. Just thinking, yeah, it, it's not just the fire that's scaring you. It's the power. Yeah. It's the cha- It's the power of the power. Yeah, and Nynaeve is still at a, in a place in her head where she's really uncomfortable with the idea of channeling at all. It freaks her out. And Egwene's thinking about the Breakers of the World. She knew now that those, at least, the Breakers of the World, had been male Aes Sedai. Which makes me think that before she thought the female Aes Sedai were, were part of it. And it makes yeah. sense to me that a lot of the population doesn't get the nuances. That they, they hear that Aes Sedai broke the world and they know all Aes Sedai are women. And that doesn't really make the connection that it was male Aes Sedai. Entirely, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of misinformation in the two rivers and all over Randland in general about Aes Sedai and you have no idea whether it's true or not so you just kind of believe it all right because nobody actually knows any Aes Sedai because right. they stay up in their white tower and they're only like a thousand of exactly. them anyway yeah I really like this next part here where Varen says I hope this shows both of you how important control is you must learn to do what you mean to do and nothing more Aside from harming someone else, if you draw more of the power than you can safely handle, you cannot handle much yet, but it will grow. If you draw too much, you can destroy yourself. You can die, or you can burn yourself out. Destroy what ability you have. Sleep well. And she leaves. (laughs) Sweet dreams. The monsters are coming to get you. Good night. (laughs) I love Aaron. She changes so suddenly in ways that's just like she states these horrible, horrible things, and then it's like, "Have a good day." <laughs> so, Rand's the Dragon Reborn, right? What, what? What's our plan? Yeah, what are we doing? What? She's uh, <laughs> she's so good at dropping these knowledge bombs on people that just leave them totally stunned. The ultimate, of course, being the Book of Black Aja. Oh yeah, that's the, oh, that's yeah. the ultimate. But maybe the so second best is when she. With is there with one of the chapters we just did when she's there with Swan and Moraine and she says, so Rand's the Dragon Reborn, right? right. And yeah. you're like, what? <laughs> I 
And for the next couple of pages, I just kind of highlighted the name of the I said I I forgot to mention before Alana is one of them. Yeah. Yeah, so it's She's I like guess the we only that. not black sister who's mentioned. She actually gets kidnapped by the dark friends. Well, yeah, because she's a link to Rand. Yep. That's not a shocker. Sorry, Alani, you kind of made that <laughs> bed yourself. Yeah. So it takes them um, four or five days, it looks like, to get to the village of Meadow? Meadow? On the River Arnon? Yeah. So mm-hmm. they're coming to the border of Shinar, basically. Mm-hmm. And then once they get to the river, they can take a boat back to Tarvalon. But each day they are visited by one of these I said I. So you get Alviarin shows up. Alviarin, sorry. Yeah, Alana flirts. Well, not flirts, but asks about the boys. Ask about the boys. And then Leandra. She's just, a predator. Yeah, I'd say it. I'd say that. Well, <laughs> what do you mean by predator? Like as in a cougar. She's on the prowl. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what, okay, then what's the difference between her and Leanne? Uh, I think Leanne's so a little bit more reserved. Leanne for now is a flirt, but she respects boundaries. She even tries with Gareth Bryn, right? And he just doesn't pick it up. And she's like, yeah, it didn't work. Sorry. Oh, he picks it up, but he's like, hmm. Skilled Domine. He's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's not into it. Yeah, he's, he's like, so yeah. in love with Swan. And he just he he knows what's going. He like gets it. He's like, I'm being played here. Like, mm-hmm. he he doesn't fall for the game. Yeah. And also, she's pretty clumsy at it because she's. That, I think he's the first person she she describes herself to starts, herself as out of practice. Yeah, doesn't she. Yeah, she says, I'm, "I haven't done this since twenty years out of practice or something like that." Yeah. So Alana's Alana's a predator, based on the fact that she bonded. Brand against his will, but I was gonna say other than that, other than that, Mrs. Uh, Lincoln. <laughs> how's, how's I actually it put in my notes. Alana would have bonded Perrin if not for Fael. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely, she tried she real hard. Just, yeah, she would have just gone. She was gonna go after the first Tavirin that, that she could pick up. Absolutely, you know, no, it's only after she fails to bond Perrin that she goes after Rand. Mm-hmm. Next thing I have is a Gween approaching Anaya to tell her that she believes Rand is in trouble because of the dream. And remember, Anaya, we think, is the head of the blue Aja. Yeah, it's suspected. And is later assassinated by Halima. Which makes sense because Anaya was pretty great. Yeah. So, And this is where a Gween really starts to become a dreamer. The queen was sure it was the Aes Sedai's questions about Rand that had made her start dreaming of him, that and worrying about him, about whether he and the others had to follow the Horn of Valir into the Blight. The dreams were always bad, but at first they were just ordinary sort of nightmare. By the night they reached Meadow, the dreams had changed, though. And this is where she gets a couple of important prophecy dreams. Or at least, I wouldn't even say prophecy, but visions of what's happening right now in other places. Yes. I think she scares away Ishmael from Rand. Yes, she absolutely does. Because they make eye contact. That's pretty awesome. And there's a scene in the next chapter, or when uh, in the next few chapters, when Rand confronts Ishmael in the portal world. Yeah. And Ishmael says, there's a girl looking after you, and it's not going to do you any good. And it's totally oh, referring to right. him. He saw Eagling. a queen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and Rand's like, Moraine's not a little girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love those moments where the point of view is just totally wrong. Yeah, and just no idea what the other person's Moraine's talking not about. A little girl. <laughs> <laughs> of course she's not, because he's not talking about Moraine. He's talking about a queen. <laughs> but none of them even know she's a dreamer. This kind of makes me wonder if, I mean, this is going probably deeper than we're meant to think about it, but it makes me wonder if... Ishmael saw Egwene and thought she was Lanfear. No. He knows Lanfear. They're both, I don't know, medium-sized, dark-haired, pretty women. In the world of dreams, you can... I don't, I don't know. No. Why would she... Why would he... Else would he leave? It is a good question of why he would be scared, and I'm wondering if it's, he's just surprised. I think he's just surprised. I think he's expecting no one to be in the world. You know, sure. World Dreams has been empty. It has been his 
he's domain. walked to his domain for 3,000 years. Yeah. The, the oh, wise wait, ones avoid so, him. Okay, so the wise ones, they're, they're smart about it. Yeah. And they make sure they're not seen. And then, and you have, of course, you have the Here's the Horn, but they're well hidden. They have special powers to not be called out. Right. I don't think they, I don't think they can be seen unless they want to be. It's only because Bridget violates the precepts that she's able to be pulled out of the, the pattern. Yeah. And the wise ones are fond of doing, being invisible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the world of dreams. The precepts that are mysterious and we don't know who sets them. No, but that may have something to do with the horn. And we don't really know the origin of the horn either. I I think it's one of the few things we may see the creator take a direct hand in. I would say that it sounds like it could be a creator thing, like a boon. That because we just we don't know the origin of the horn, and we don't know what mm-hmm. bonds the heroes to the horn, and we don't know who set out the precepts. And those seem but all fairly it's all related. clearly optional. Yeah, and it's all clearly for good. Moraine left, and then Varen left, and then Leandrin left. Or I guess the other way. Uh, all Moraine right after and each other. And Varen, one right after the other. They have no idea what's going on there. I, so I, I think they're all leaving for different reasons. Separately? Yeah. Not because the other, others have left? Well, I think Moraine is going... Doesn't she end up with the twins looking for information? Isn't that the next time we mm-hmm. see her? Yeah. So she's doing research. Mm-hmm. So she takes off to just like... She's like stopping to find out as much information as she can about Rand before she gets back to the tower. It's mentioned that she takes interest in what all the other sisters know and spends time questioning all of them save the Red Sisters, and then she disappears. Mm -hmm. Leandrin, I assume, is on orders, possibly from Alviarn. She she might be following Moraine. Yeah, that's kind of what I suspected, but there's no way to know. But Leandrin may also have the compulsion orders. She may not know what she's doing. Possibly. And, and then, then Varen. Varen. I always assumed that they were following Moraine, but now I'm realizing that that absolutely doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, not necessarily, but, see, Varen, but it very well could be. It could it's, be. It's hard Varen to say. Leaves, Varen leaves so fast she leaves behind her warder. That Which is makes me think suspicious. she's acting on information that she got immediately and she like jumps on her horse and leaves. Doesn't Thomas not know that Varen's black? No, he's he's black. He is? Yeah. Uh, I forget, I'm he's must be thinking friend. of a different sister. He spent his last hour with his family. But he was dark for he broke his bonds as well. what? He, his last hour? Yeah, because you remember how Varen takes the poison and then spends her last hour. With Egwene? Yeah. He has a choice where he's going to spend his last hour after he knows he's going to die. And he chooses to spend it with his family. Hmm. But he's also violating his oaths to the, to the dark. Yeah, there's definitely a few other black sisters who are captured that their warders don't know they're black. Yeah, But Varen's not that. one of them. I wonder if Varen's following Leandrin, because she's researching the black odd jaw. I think that that makes sense. Because Leandrin takes off, Varen has to take off immediately. Right. Hmm. I mean, it it could be one follows the other, that, that Moraine takes off, Leandrin, under orders to follow her, takes off, and Varen, trying to research the Black Aja, takes off after her. I like that theory the best. And that's why they leave one after the other after the other. And why Varen might not bring Thomas. Like, if you let Leandrin, if you wait even minutes, she you might not be able to tra- track her anymore. Yeah. I wonder if Leandrin is going to meet Sean Chan. She would have to travel somehow. And by travel, well, I mean travel, travel, or... How does but she... don't, aren't some of the Sean Chan on Ranland because when she kidnaps the girls, they meet up with Suroth, right? Yeah, but she does that under orders of... Ishmael's. I don't think that she's arranging the meeting. I think Ishmael is. Where do well, they meet Surah? I'm just saying Where she does she meet Surah? She... she meets Surah on Toman Head. Now, she could be going through the ways. She knows She knows how to navigate the ways. We see that later. Yeah. Yeah. So she could be taking the ways out to Toman Head to confer with them. Entirely possible. Hmm. She must know how to read Ogier script. 
Well, she comes back to she comes back to the tower and says, "Oh, something happened to Rand. Like you must come with me now. We're gonna go through the ways." Oh yeah, the next time she is mentioned, I just did a search of the book, mm -hmm. is literally when she walks into the room at the White Tower. Okay, so, so she's she's doing dark friend stuff. Yeah, so she's off doing dark friend stuff, possibly getting orders arranging. to a, arranging this whole the whole kidnapping. Because she has met with these girls, you know, she's seen them, she's spent a little bit of time with them. She's going to go tell them yeah. about it. She ends up kidnapping Elaine, too, but that's entirely by accident. Her whole goal is to kidnap these two novices and send them mm -hmm. across the ocean. So I'm, I'm almost, I bet she's collected information on them, quizzed them about Rand, and she's I'm off nodding. to report. Yeah. I... Right, because the tower, the tower is doing everything in their power to recruit them as channelers powerful channelers and strings to ran and the black Aja is going to do everything they can to cut those strings and not just a uh, strings to rand but the blues and greens are we know are excited about uh, Egwene and nynaeve because they're really likely mm -hmm. to go one of those routes but not mm -hmm. not just blue or green but also definitely not black not red yeah and yeah not black and not, red. Yeah, not yeah. red there's no way no Right. And so it's it's both, you know, personal, I think, that she wants to get rid of them because they're not going to go red and also... Yeah, they're not going to go red or black. Yeah, is, is where where her values align. It helps both red Aja and black Aja to get rid of them. Yeah. I'm I'm convinced by that. And then I, I think Varen would be tracking her. I'm not sure. Well, Varen does end up meeting up with Rand at the end of this book. I just searched her name. She pops up two chapters later with Inktar and Matt. Oh. Literally in a chapter and a half. Inktar. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I just read that. So she, how the heck does she know where they are? How does she travel Do you think that she's fast? she's communicating with Inktar? How does she travel that she fast? She could be using the ways. That's crazy. She just like takes off and then shows up. Within a day or two, she must she must have used the ways. Snakes and foxes is writing how she channeled on any of the boys, but has she like touched them or given them anything or? And then when she shows up, Moraine said, "I sent me Lord Ingtar." Varen announced with a satisfied smile. She thought you might need me. Such a gallop I've had. But what if she's been in communication with Ingtar from Faldara? Because he's a dark friend, and they know of each other. And she just says, you know, keep me, in, or, or gives him a tracker. Like, who knows? Now, it does seem that she followed their path, because she, like, saw the Murdral nailed up against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So she's following them. But how? They could. There could be some kind of tracking on... Any of okay. any of the three boys. Yeah, or hey, just even Ingtar. Or Ingtar. Yeah. She doesn't have to track, track the boys. She just has to track the Shinarans. Yeah. Right, or any of the lances. Right. They should be. It should be easy yeah. enough for them to be tracked and for her to know where they're going, where they are. So, but it it could be dark friend information too. So Varen's really smart, and she, based on what happens in Faldara. She's like, there's got to be a dark friend in in uh, in a high rank here, and maybe she just like puts a tracker on some on Ingtar as a contingency, and is like, I'm gonna see if he like ingratiates himself, man manages to find a way to ingratiate himself like close to Rand. The other thing know. is like at the dark friend social, Ingtar was like out there yelling like, if she was at the dark friend social, she probably recognizes him. Probably. That also could be because he wasn't disguised at all. He was a shine iron with a top hat. Like there was no or top top knot. There was no yeah. He wasn't in disguise, as far as I can tell. So if she was there in disguise, she would totally just have recognized him as a dark friend. But she isn't following Leandrin. No, she's not following no. Leandrin at all. No, I think we've we've conclusively said that, and she's not going acting on Moraine's orders either. No. Egwene's dream. And she's talking to Anaya. Mm -hmm. That's where we left off. 
I just have she scares away Ishmael, and then she sees Lanfear uh, leering over Rand's sleeping bag. And that's the first clue that Lanfear is, is watching Rand and is... And then the next chapter, Rand is in the portal world. Yeah. So that's definitely Lanfear. I kind of want to read this because there's, there's a good amount to it. Totally agree with that. Yeah. That, that, that she has a vision of Lanfear activating the portal stone and sending them off into the portal mm-hmm. world. Yeah. First, there had been a man with a mask over his face and fire in place of his eyes. Despite the mask, she had thought he was surprised to see her. His look had frightened her till she thought her bones would break from shivering. But suddenly he vanished and she saw Rand sleeping on the ground, wrapped in a cloak. A woman had been standing over him, looking down. So that tells us that in the next couple of chapters when Ishmael confronts Rand, that is a dream. I believe so, yeah. yeah. I think Ishmael is always confronting Rand in dreams. That's how he's able to find him. He's, he's a big blazing bonfire yeah. to Viren in the world of dreams. So Ishmael's there, Aguin shows up, Ishmael leaves. He's just startled. And then yeah. Lanfear shows up. <laughs> a woman had been standing over him looking down her face in shadow but her eyes seemed to shine like the moon and Egwene had known she was evil then there was a flash of light and they were gone both of them and behind it all almost like another thing altogether was a feel of danger as if a trap was beginning to snap shut a trap with many jaws she also adds that she knows it's all about Rand and has nothing to do with her mm-hmm. That's interesting that it happens. I, I didn't really put it. Reading this again it kind of puts it in perspective that that all happens really quickly, and we see Rand's confrontation confrontation with Ishmael in the next chapter. It makes sense that it's happening in Tel Ran Riyadh and not not the real world. Yeah, and then he and he, he is, disappears and Lanfear's there in a flash. Totally. No, I think she was already there. Yeah, or I they think, were both there were at both the same there, time because she said. A woman had been standing over him, not that a woman was suddenly standing over him. Oh, good like point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, th- I think that I think both Ishmael and Lanfear were watching him. I think so. Based on what Aguin says to Anaya, Anaya really quickly says, "Oh, you're probably a dreamer, more or less," which is funny because it takes so long in the series for anyone else to notice. Not well, that I said I would have been very helpful. Anaya believes her. Um, nobody else does. Hmm. Because Anaya... And even Anaya is like, oh, it's so rare, though. It probably is just a dream. But still, maybe we should do some testing. And But they have no way of testing. They haven't had a dreamer in such a long time. They don't even know how to I test know. for a dreamer. Yeah, nobody knows. You know, it, yeah. the the Aiel, the wise ones, recognize her as a dreamer the second. They're like, oh, yeah, you're a dreamer. Of course you are. Like, we know that because we're dreamers too and even anaya <laughs> here is her first reaction is that is she says something along uh where is it here that tall boy from your village missing him already are you yeah and i mean in in anaya's defense you know that is the most likely the thing most li- yeah yeah she, she's got this guy like they're semi-betrothed you know they're going through dangerous things yeah, it's been four or five hundred years. Who was the last one uh, who studied all the dream Terran Griel? I guess that wasn't even, she wasn't even a dreamer. She just studied the Terran Griel. Was that, Cor- was her name Corian? Yes, yes. Oh, I just want to. She was a dreamer, but that's a good point. By something. When you mentioned the wise ones, so Egwene actually accidentally stumbles upon a meese. In the world of dreams, pretending to be a maiden again. Uh, yes. Hunting yes. a lion. That's right. Oh, and then she like Anna. vanishes and then Anise like follows her and is like, girl. Come to us. <laughs> <laughs> what are you hey, doing? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was definitely thinking the the whole land fear thing definitely was a, a moment of opportunity. You know, she's been following him for some time. And when she saw him lay down next to the portal stone, she was like, yoink and pulls him through just to get him alone. Yeah. And she just happens to pull Huron and uh, Loyal through because they're Loyal. sleeping close. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's a pretty good segue into the next chapter. Yeah. Should I read this last paragraph? Get us out of out of here? Yeah. Chapter 12? Re- read us out of chapter sure. 12. <laughs> Aguin peered into the dark toward the south. He was out there somewhere, 
Not in Feldara. Not in the Blight. She was sure of it. Hold on, you wool-headed idiot. If you get yourself killed before I can get you out of this, I will skin you alive. It did not occur to her to ask how she was going to get him out of anything, going to Tarvalin as she was. Snugging her cloak around her, she set out to find a boat to the River Queen. early on I was like so are you guys gonna like bash Fael cause I'm gonna like bow out now or are y'all cool and you're like no we love all the female characters we're gonna talk about it we're gonna analyze like we're gonna I remember yeah, yeah. I remember writing that email and that was definitely I, that was something I sat down with Patrick I think before we even started and I was very serious about it yeah it was definitely early on, but we've we've had conversations before we started the podcast. We've had conversations about that and how it's like weird that people online seem to all hate the female characters, like a really overwhelming number of people in any post about like Fael or Aguin or anyone. I think it overwhelms the subreddit a little bit just because it's like mm-hmm. they don't do a search. And so it seems like every week someone will come in with a post. It's like, does anyone else hate, you know, such a <laughs> female character? And then the commenters are like, yes, some people do. Like, here's some analysis of, like, why that's the case, like, insight into the character. And, I mean, I get it. Like, not everyone's going to like, you know, all the characters. But it is annoying if you're, well, like, yeah. wanting to have a discussion and it's like well you didn't really like get the character so much so yeah i always i don't i don't know i don't, I don't want to present myself as some like being a white knighty but i always thought that that was a really cool aspect to the wheel of time that there are strong female characters because when else do you get to see that right well and as a teenager i was like i have no idea what women are thinking maybe if i read this fantasy <laughs> book it'll get tell some me insight here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so Aradia mentions that they feel like Robert Jordan wrote a limited view of the female mind. And so that's a, le- I feel like that's a legitimate criticism of, sure. but, but that said, like, I love most of the female characters and relate to a lot of them. So, and like I, I don't s- think yeah. of them all as the same person. Right. Right. Absolutely. Which is often when I think of poor writing of female characters, I can read an author's a depiction and every single female character is exactly the same throughout the entire, you know, I can't tell them apart. They're just all, uh, they're not individuals to me. Yeah, that's true in a lot of cases. I guess Dune might be another example where there's yeah powerful women. It's also another one of my favorite series, and I'm... Not typically. Well, I mean, I'm. I guess I'm more of a fantasy person than a sci-fi person. I've definitely read a lot more fantasy than sci-fi. Yeah, I guess I could elaborate and say that clearly they have distinct personalities because if you hate like one of them but not the others, clearly like there's something distinct about their personality. Like, no, I think that's what makes Jordan different than some of the other authors that I've read. Yeah. Is that that he's able to to give them all individuals, and it's getting a lot better. I think modern fantasy authors are really cognizant of the demographics of their readership and what they want to see. Yeah, I've noticed that in some of Sanderson's other books, Cosmere mm-hmm. stuff. There's a lot more female characters with large roles. I guess I should say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm nodding. Uh, so I didn't, realize, <laughs> I didn't realize how often I would say yeah until you guys mentioned that, oh, instead of saying yeah over and over, you would say I'm nodding. And so then I realized, yeah, I say yeah, like every other word. I, I do a lot of uh, I guesses and I think so's and I'll start half a sentence and then restart it. Um, Ooh, I do that a lot. Since we started recording ourselves, I noticed that I 
or I'll start a sentence and just trail off because I feel like you know what I'm talking about, but that doesn't necessarily mean (laughs) just like only say half a thing. Got a little bit of a cold going on, but it happens every year. You don't sound like it to me. Yeah, well, I'm just like slightly congested. It's not too bad. And I managed to get a ton of sleep last night, so that's nice. I'm jealous. (laughs) Yeah? I haven't been sleeping well the last week or so. I tend to like alternate. This is probably awful for my health, but I'll sleep like four or five hours and then like 10 the next night and then like three and then like another big chunk. I I just can't manage to like be on a regular schedule ever. Well, doesn't your schedule work schedule vary quite a bit too, morning to evening? Well, I guess you're always pretty much in the morning. Yeah. Somewhere between seven and nine is when I start. So you really have no one to blame but yourself is what you're saying. Yeah, I just can't, I don't know. Smartphones. I'll be like listening to a podcast and have the glow of a screen in front of my face. And I'm like, and and I wonder why I can't sleep. (laughs) (laughs) I have the same problem. It's constant streaming content. Yeah. And late night reading. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?